On today's show, certified business coach Laura Wellman is joining us from the Biz Studio. Laura believes small business owners should make money, make more money, and still have time to enjoy their lives. That's something we can get behind. Before becoming a business coach, Laura worked for 15 years in marketing and communications, as well as helping business owners make more intentional decisions about business. She also runs popular Ottawa blog, Kids in the Capital. Thanks for being here with us today, Laura. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, let's start off and just tell if you can just tell a little bit about yourself and what do people know you by? Sure. Um, so I am a business coach, but I've been an entrepreneur for over a dozen years and I love helping other people figure out what it is that they love to do and how they can make money doing it while still enjoying life. And I've learned how to do that you know, through training, but also through life experience, because I've had quite a number of businesses. I'm, I'm somebody who has a lot of ideas and makes them happen. So, you know, who, what do people know me for? They know me for having a lot of ideas and starting things randomly and, <laughs> and making life happen um, and business happen and doing the things I love to do. No, that's great. Well, so you, you mentioned you've had multiple entrepreneur journeys and different businesses. Let's let's start off at the beginning. So how did you get started in terms of which ones and did people kind of guide you or did they fall in your lap? How how did you start this kind of entrepreneurial bug that you you currently have? So I always had a feeling I would be a business owner before I ever had any idea of what kind of business, right? So I was never driven by I want to do this kind of business. I was just like you know, honestly, I just didn't want a boss. I wanted to be able to decide what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And that's a little bit of my ADHD brain, right? Like, it's like, I have exciting ideas and I want to be able to do them when I want to. And I don't want to be ruled by somebody else. So I think in the end, I'm going to need to be a business owner. Um, so that was always sort of swimming around for me. When I had my first child um, 13 years ago, when I was on maternity leave, I had the idea that we, um, a friend of mine who was also on maternity leave, should start an online children's clothing store. And that was my very first business was retail online 13 years ago before there was even like really easy ways to do that. And that was the very first step I took in to entrepreneurship. And it wasn't, nobody handed it to me. I was just like, let's figure this out. And that's probably the best thing too, right? Um, because you had some extra time maybe um, while you were on mat leave and you basically wanted to pursue something different, right? And figure out what, what is going to happen and make out of it, right? So um, did you have prior training to before starting that business in that industry or? Nothing, none at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> I did some research. We went to like the local business center and, you know, had a few meetings, but mostly we winged it. Um, and honestly, um, the business did as well as you would expect having winged it. <laughs> so prior to starting your business, um, what was your career and where did you go to school kind of? Sure. Um, so I, I have a degree from Carleton in psychology, and then I had uh, have a diploma from uh, Algonquin College in public relations. So what okay. I did in my career was marketing communication. I worked for a university. I did a lot of corporate communications, website stuff, you know, the president's website, the all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. So then um, how did things work out for your first venture? So we actually opened a bricks and mortar location, oh, nice. okay. um, but the timing and the, the actual passion for the business weren't right. So a couple things happened. Number one, we opened the bricks and mortar in August of 2008. And I don't know if you remember what... That was the financial crisis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like the next month, like, was like a few weeks later, like everything crashed. Um, <laughs> so it was not the ideal time. Um, but I also ended up um, pregnant again, which was fine, especially with a kid's clothing story, bring your baby to work. It's all good. But it turned out I was having twins. Ooh. 
Um, and there were just a lot of things that were like, you know what, this is not actually what it's meant to be. So we closed that business down and I slowed down quite a lot as I had two new babies after that. Um, and then I reinvented myself after that, but that was, that was a few years. It was online and bricks and mortar. Then it was like online for about a year after bricks and mortar, just to sort of wind it down. And then we let it go. Yeah. And I guess at that time, um, there was no Amazon effect yet. Right. So having a website digitally, um, did you find that there was a competitive advantage or did you find that having a bricks and mortar um, actually had a lot of walk in traffic and drove a lot more of your engagement? So I would say, in fact, that um, without like as opposed to not having competition, people weren't used to buying online yet. Mm, gotcha. So it wasn't a natural thing for most people. Yeah. Um, I think that the business would have done fairly well in the long run, but like the, the crash, the economic crash, right. When we started, there was also a big bus strike in Ottawa, which is where I live oh, that gotcha. year. Like, like there were just a lot of things against us. Yeah. Um, so definitely we had walk-in traffic. We had some really loyal clients, but there were a, a number of battles that made it. And you know what? It turned out I just didn't want, I, like I felt just as locked to that, like by the hours of the store and having to be there all the time. Like it ended up being like, it's a full-time job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I as guess opposed the to the freedom is... I imagined. Yeah. Doing it yourself or having backing is a little bit different. Um, and timing is always important, right? It might not have been a good time based on where you're at in terms of your life, especially when you have two young kids or three young kids at three that time. Kids, right? yeah. So how much time can you really devote into the business versus, you know, where does your priorities, you know, weigh? Like you, you probably want to spend more time with the kids, especially at that age, right? Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, starting your business, um, I know you mentioned like you and your girlfriend kind of winged it. Um, did you, and you, you got a lot of information and support from local, I guess, agencies. Um, was there any other people that kind of pushed you along or um, did you go out and seek some mentors to try to help you become more successful? Um, so the first, the very first business I had, that one I did, I did a lot of networking. I mean, I've always done a lot of networking. So I would meet other people. I would try to learn more skills about marketing, figure out how to get the, the word out there, but not a lot, right? It wasn't until really my third business, fourth business, depends how you look at what, which businesses are which, <laughs> um, that I got a business coach. And that was when I really started seeing the big growth was fine. That, that was the investment I needed to make until that I was sort of just, you know, figuring it out and doing the best I could. And it was, it was all right, but you know, I, and I met a lot of business owners. I always tried to surround myself with other business owners. I think that's crucial in every part of your life, whether it's as a business owner, as a parent, whatever, you want to find other people who are doing the same things as you, because it's important to have community that you relate with that way. Yeah, aligning yourself with like-minded kind of individuals or people that have the same sort of goals or passions in mind, right? So mm -hmm. that was, you know, that's good. Um, so growing up even, um, you know, you, you did study PR and, you know, you worked at a lot of different, you know, colleges, universities and whatnot. Um, what, what drove you to really become your own boss like it's just because you didn't want a boss of your own uh, you, you didn't want someone controlling and dictating your hours um, or did it kind of fall on your lap like you thought of a great opportunity and you you pursued it like you mentioned you have mo you've done multiple different businesses as well so tell us a little bit of some of those ones as well sure so kids in the capital which you mentioned in the intro is something i started about a year after the twins were born and it's a blog in the ottawa area for parents in the national capital region um it's been around now for nine and nine and a half years nine years anyhow okay. a, a long time um and that was another one so i was like there's a need let's create it. Um, and it's a business stream for me, right? So we, we make money, we have advertisers. It's, you know, I've got There's a team that helped me run it. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, nice. So that's an example. I did a social media conference for four years here in wow. Ottawa. I was, you know, about 200 people every year would come. Nice. And uh, that was another one. It was, it was called Social Capital. Um, nice. So I've done a lot of little things, yeah. right? So it's, the idea is like, while I say it's like, I don't want to have a boss, but it's really that when I have an inspired idea and I want to do it, I want to be able to do it. And like when you're working for somebody else, like there are opportunities for that, but you can't just like suddenly like pivot a hundred degrees and be like, now I'm going to go start a conference. They're like, but that has nothing to do with your job. (laughs) (laughs) No. And this is, I think what happens as an entrepreneur, you get this entrepreneurial, um, you know, you're always coming up with ideas, right? And no one really understands until you're an entrepreneur yourself. And then you can reflect and you, you try to throw different ideas along and some stick and some don't, but at least you have the opportunity to do something about it because if no one's doing it, guess what? You could be the one, right? So no, I totally understand where you're coming from because I, I have the same feeling all the time. And when I talk to my team and staff, no one really understands it because they're never like, they're not in that same situation, right? Like they're not in the same position. And I'm a really go person, right? Like I, I like to do things and I like to do them now. So I don't have when like, you know, you work in like a university, for example, there's a lot of red tape. They're like, yeah, we can do it. But first we have to get approval from these 15 different people. And then we have to have everything translated. And I'm like, ugh. Right. Versus I just relaunched my podcast um, in September and I went from I think I'm going to relaunch my podcast to having recorded five episodes and having the first three online in like two weeks. Right. Because I'm like, and go. (laughs) And I can. So that that's another thing. It's just I have the freedom to be able to take the ideas I have and just go with them this way. Do it. Yeah. When when you work for a big company or any larger organization, things take so much longer, right? Even yeah. change takes a long time. So being a small, nimble company, you're able to pivot, right? And so you, you have to think about that as a real strong advantage, especially if things aren't working well, you can easily pivot to try something different, right? As opposed to you plan and budget accordingly six months, one year in advance, it doesn't work out when then what next, right? Then you got to replan and budget again. Because I did work for large companies as well. And it was very, very frustrating. But I see where they're coming from, because they have a national scope, they got so many clients, like it makes sense for them, right? So um, as a small business, there are a lot of pros to it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so currently, do you have like uh, mentors, coaches? Uh, do you go- belong to mastermind classes? Like, how do you surround yourself with like-minded individuals? Right. So I, I was saying it was I think it was about um, five years ago almost that I hired my first business coach, and okay. um, so another business, another iteration of my business was I did. Um, when I I started consulting, I did social media consulting. I would teach people how to use social media. I was teaching small business owners doing social media strategy. That's when I went into this sort of consulting world. Um, And that's what I was doing then. And I hired my first business coach then. And I haven't been without a coach since. I really, no matter what, I will always pay for somebody (laughs) to help me partially because um, then I'm all in right? Like there's no excuse when I've got, like, I have, I have invested in something and I'm going to follow through because I want to make sure that that investment was worthwhile. And I, I haven't always had the same coach. I uh, look for a coach who fits me where I'm at now. And um, I'm also always in like, so I have a coach, but within a group. So they're mastermind coach coaching programs. So it's never just me and the coach, it's me and a bunch of other people. And I really find that helpful in terms of finding other people to be inspired by and to work with. So I had one before, now I'm in a different one with somebody in the States. And, you know, there's all these amazing other business owners, as well as my coach who are pushing me to do new things, to try new things, to uh, find the best way to do things. And I love that. No, that's amazing. Um, because even myself, I I have to agree, I don't have a coach or a mentor, like, I don't have that in place, but I'm always looking. Um, and the challenge is I'm in a different unique space as well, right? Like not a lot of people understand SEO. 
Um, but I mean, they understand technology and scaling a business. So maybe that's why I need to step up outside of my comfort zone to um, embrace myself with more tech savvy people and whatnot. Um, but well, I do beauty- understand where you're coming from because with, you know, being a, having personal trainers or coaches and being athletes, I mean, they're the ones that make it right. They've been working with someone that pushes them that, ha- you know, you're more motivated when someone's right there on long with you pushing you to be better, right? Um, So I totally get it. Um, And for me, it's more self-motivation, but I I get where you're coming from because with a coach, not everyone is self-motivated, right? Um, And so it helps people push them along, definitely. Yeah, so some of it is motivation and some of it is thinking in different ways, right? So to your point about not knowing SEO, I would say that having a coach who doesn't really understand SEO means that they're going to ask you the kinds of questions that get you thinking enough that you might figure out something different. So people get stuck thinking this is how it's always been done. This is in my industry. This is how we do this. I have a lot of clients that I don't really know much about their industry. I have a lot of lawyers, for example, right? So I'm like, okay, so you run a law firm and I am not a lawyer. And so tell me, what if you did this? And they'll be like, hmm, well, it's not, it's allowed, but nobody really does it. (laughs) Okay. And is that something you'd want to do? Maybe, right? But like, but if you just go to like somebody who's always done it the same way, they'll always do the same thing. So it just allows you to have somebody's different perspective because we yeah. also are in our own heads. Like we can convince ourselves of whatever we want to convince ourselves. So you need somebody outside your brain sometimes to reflect back at you. And that totally makes sense because different perspectives, right? People in different walks of life, different ideas, you know, different inspirations, different everything. Right. Um, but surrounding yourself with kind of same goal focus individuals, Um, to align yourself to become successful. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are really good points. Um, So I wanted to ask you, so can you give us some of the biggest, uh, some of, some of the challenges that you've kind of faced, some of the biggest mistakes that you've made over the years, because as an entrepreneur, I continually still make them and therefore no one I believe can be perfect. Right. So um, can, can you let us, some of the listeners uh, know about them and how did you overcome them? Sure. And first, I I would say like failing isn't actually failing, right? I think we've all been taught in life that being perfect is the ideal, but failing forward, the idea that you like go through things and then figure new things out and change, like that's actually how we grow. So I like to always remind people like we, we shouldn't be aiming for perfection. We want to be willing to try new things out and get comfortable with failing. That's where the biggest innovations come from. So that's one point. But I've made lots of mistakes. And one of them was not hiring a coach soon enough, not actually going and getting help soon enough, um, winging things, you know, not having solid financial plans. I did a whole blog post a couple years ago about the fir- the 10 financial or maybe it was five financial mistakes I made in my first 10 years. Like it was all like, I didn't, I didn't always save the HST because it was like, but I need the money, right? Like there's yeah. all these things where I, I wasn't really properly planning for things. Yeah. Um, and for me, I'm like not a big planner by nature. Like I'm like, no, I want to like just wing it. I want to, you know, Spontaneous, yeah. stop tying me down. Yeah. And um, so I had to learn how to plan in a way that worked for me so that I had, you know, basic rules. I had certain guidelines. I had all the things that meant that I couldn't break my business, but still had the freedom to try to do things and not have to have like a 50 page report plan because that's not my way. But because I wasn't doing that, because I was winging things too much, I would sort of, a lot of it was money stuff, right? I would spend all kinds of money that I really mm. shouldn't have spent on things. And, gotcha. and then I'd be like, now I don't have enough money for this, right? Like, like actually paying myself first and, and making sure that I always have a salary before I like go invest a whole bunch of marketing stuff. Like you actually sitting down and planning that stuff. I I just tried to wing it for way too long um, and it doesn't work. Yeah. And this is a great point for all the listeners that are thinking of starting, right? As much as you have a great idea, you have to have some solid foundations as to what should you do 
when you start a business, right? Yeah, you go get licensed, make sure that you're either a small business or incorporate, but taxes and payroll and, you know, accounting, don't mess with that stuff. Get someone that actually is really good at it, pay them really good for that. Because if you're not strong, like, then you probably don't want to do it because you may probably make more mistakes. Um, I'm very fortunate. Like I, I studied finance and my wife's an accountant. So <laughs> we are in a really good situation in terms of finance. So we're pretty, you know, savvy in terms of where to budget, how to allocate and forecast. Um, but most people aren't in the same situation. So whatever you're strong at, focus on that and pay for a service that you're not strong at. And it could be sales even, right? Like as a business owner, you must be very confident in positioning yourself and asking for the sale or learn negotiation skills and know what values and benefits and all that stuff. Like I'm very fortunate that I've been doing sales all my life, right? So, you know, going into business, it's different for a lot of people and they go in for different reasons, right? So you have to understand what your strengths are going in and find people that are going to fill the gaps of your business because not everyone's going to be good at everything. And, you know, hundred percent. And I, I mean, I have an amazing assistant who's been with me for six or seven years now. And like, I, she has like, the complimentary brain to mine, right? So where I'm like, let's do this and all of this. And she's like, let's have a plan and yep. let's not forget all the details. <laughs> yep. um, so I absolutely think it's important to be able to understand where your strengths are and figure out what you need to complement that. So yep. she's there to support me. And then knowing that you're not, like you can't expect to be good at everything. So sales was actually not a really strong point for me. I've done a lot of sales training since um, I started because I was leaving all kinds of money on the table by, you know, if, if you're going to offer somebody something that costs $200 or something that costs $20,000, they're going to take the $200 thing. <laughs> yes. Um, but if you understand how to position the value of what you're selling and be like, but you know what, you really need the $20,000 $20, things and you realize that they're going to they're going to do what you suggest based on how well you can explain the value. Then you realize like, Oh, well that made it a lot easier to make $20,000 instead of 200. <laughs> like totally agree. So you have to understand your worth. Right. Um, and you got to know your competitors and figure out like, what are the true differentiators? What's your unique selling proposition? Right. So, um, these are and really sell valid it with points. confidence. Like if you're worried, they're going to think it's expensive then when you tell them how much it is, they're going to think it's expensive because they can tell you're worried. Yes. Right. Like, but if you confidently think, come and join my $10,000 mastermind program, it's an amazing deal. Like, I can't believe how much I'm giving you for this. Then they're going to be like, wow, that's awesome. Like it, it changes everything when you truly understand your own value and convey it that way. Totally, totally agree. And you know, if, especially if you're selling a product or service, you're the best you know, salesperson out there, like no one else will be able to explain things better than you should. Right. So you got to really practice that art of knowing what you're worth or what that value is. Right. Um, to, to the prospects. Definitely. Which, which speaks to the point, which is, I think what I talk about most with my clients um, and had to work on the most with myself, which is mindset stuff, understanding yeah. where my money blocks were, understanding where I was uncomfortable with yeah. certain levels of success. Like people, I talk about um, fear of success a lot and people are like, I'm not afraid of success. I'm like, but are you? <laughs> because <laughs> sometimes what that means is you're like, yeah, I really want to be successful. But if I reach this level of success, it's going to mean this much more work and so much more pressure and da, 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 da. And so you're like, I want to be successful, but you're also worried that it's going to come with all kinds of strings you don't want. So you actually don't try to get there. Yeah. And what does success mean to certain people, right? Is it money or is it authority? Is it, you know, being known from by their peers that they are someone people t turn to like, you know, uncovering that from people. Right. And then kind of gearing to them towards that and hopefully helping them um, get to that level. It's great. 
great points. Um, so some of the advice, I know we talked about some of the mistakes, right? And I know we've been kind of picking your brain as well. Um, but yeah, can you give us maybe three tips or advice that you would give some of these new entrepreneurs um, who are starting, thinking of starting or have been doing it for one to three years? Um, you know, you've been doing it for 10 plus years and you've run a couple businesses. What kind of advice can you give them? Well, I think we've talked about some of them, right? Like don't try to do everything alone. And I think we have a tendency to think that it's better if we can figure it out by ourselves and like somehow that makes us stronger and, but like go out and ask for help, read books, talk to mentors, talk to other business owners, hire a business coach, find people who can help you get there faster because that's, that's what that is, right? Like you, it's not that you can't get there by figuring it out on your own. You probably can, but there are also ways to skip some of the steps because other people have already figured this stuff out, right? They've yes. already been through all of this. So go and talk to other people and figure out who it is that can support you because we're all so much stronger together and people want to help. That's so important. Um, because a lot, there's a lot of introverts out there, right? People are scared to communicate and let people know that they're vulnerable. They, they're struggling. Right. Um, and I, I'm fortunate that I'm very much so an extrovert that I, I'm very social and I, I enjoy that, uh, social aspect of communicating with people, but I know I can tell, and I, I want to support and help them any way that I can. Right. The challenge is they just aren't comfortable, right? How do you break down that barrier? Because they might be very comfortable just sitting at their desk doing their own work, right? And not engaging with others because they're scared what other people will say, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's a challenge. One of them is, again, like asking for help is is not something that's been positioned as a strong thing. And I think it, it's a lot more powerful and strong to ask for help and support than to try to like muddle around in your muck by yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of what I try to do to get the message out there is just to share that it's not perfect, right? Like, so I am known <laughs> to be very... Um, a straight shooter and honest, right? Like there are days when like, I, like it still happens to me. And, and I think it's comforting to people to know that there are days where I'm like, maybe I should just go find a job because this sucks, <laughs> right? Like that still happens. Yeah. Um, and, and knowing that some days aren't easy and knowing that I've struggled with all the things that you guys struggle with and knowing, right? Like constantly helping people realize like they're not the only ones sitting by themselves thinking that they're terrible at something. We all are judging ourselves. We all have imposter syndrome. Even the like business owners who are making seven figures and multi seven figures, they also suddenly feel like, who am I to be doing this? So it's not just because you're you and you're starting and you're never going to be able to do it, that you're doubting yourself knowing we all have this. So it's okay, right? And the more you sort of can embrace that, I think the easier it is to start talking about it. Yeah, and these are really valid points because when you're starting off, you think you need to know everything, right? About that product or service or that subject that you're trying to sell. However, what I've learned is there's a lot of people that don't know as much as you do and sell to them. Don't sell to the people that know more than you. If you're a level five and there's people below you in levels one to four, go out and sell to them. Don't sell to level six and up, right? Know your market, know your strengths, know what your value are, and then go sell to those people. So like I'm learning myself and I try to embrace and talk to a lot of business owners. And I, I'm very fortunate that I surround myself with a lot of business owners. So I get to know them and I'm very social. So I don't mind asking questions and they are very willing to help because they want to see people succeed. Right. That's the big joy I found as an entrepreneur. Business owners actually care about other business owners. They want to, see success they want people to enjoy a better life and do, they they like supporting people that are actually doing something about something versus not doing anything about anything right mm -hmm. and just living it day by day and you know 
going through the grind, right, of day-to-day activity. So sure, yeah, and I mean that goes to the next point, which would be like, don't get too bogged down in comparison and competition, yes. because there's always going to be somebody who charges more than you. There's always going to be somebody who charges less than you, um, and you know, don't think of everybody who does what you do as your competition. Think of how you serve your people best, right? Like it's just about being really clear on who you want to be with and how you're doing the best job for those people. Because if you get caught up in the world of what are they doing and how am I, and how do I compare? Like, it's just the the energy of that is so heavy that it takes up your bandwidth to go do stuff. And so if you just focus on how awesome you're doing and don't worry about, I mean, it's not, I mean, you want to know what other people are doing, but if you are trying to like compare yourself constantly, that just becomes an energy suck that you don't need. Yeah. And just surround yourself with positive, like-minded people, right? Because, um, you know, negativity, even in your team or staff or your clients even, right? Like those people that drain you, especially, you know, you've been going through multiple businesses, but I, I hate clients that actually think they know more than me, right? So why even reach out to me in the first place? right? Like, it just boggles my mind. And then when they question why I price certain things, and I'm like, well, this is what you get from how we value it. And this is what we believe it's, and we felt like a lot of our clients are getting a good return based on our pricing model. If you don't feel that way, go find someone in your price range, right? Like, I'm okay. And, you know, it came along, like after a couple years, it felt great saying no to people. And it was the greatest feeling because not everyone's going to be your client. No. And that's such an important lesson. And, you know, it goes against some of the things we've all grown up hearing, like the customer's always right. It's like, (laughs) no, they're not. They're really not. Right. Um, And not like you don't have to please everybody. You don't have to do everything to make sure the customer is always happy. You need to have boundaries and you need to know how your business is going to operate and you need to stick to those. And that's going to make everybody happier. Yes. Um, Be very clear on the onset and set proper expectations because if you don't, they're going to grind you and cause nightmares throughout the, the, you know, the entire process. Right. So yeah, I've learned that a long time ago as well, but yeah. um, It's, it's a great feeling though, knowing what you're worth and being Mm -hmm. able to turn people down, especially if they're not good fit. Right. You know, you're, ideal persona and client base, right? So just stick with your, that. Yeah. And knowing your price, your value is important in pricing wise, like so many entrepreneurs under charge. And it's, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of what they'll do. So if I'm talking to those beginning entrepreneurs again, it's make sure you're charging enough to make what you need to make. Like you can't just charge like top prices out the gate, but you also need to know if it's going to add up. If you want to make a certain amount of money and you have a certain amount of hours and then you make up your pricing based on what you think people are going to pay and none of those numbers add up to each other, that's a problem. (laughs) But people don't actually look at it. They're just kind of like, will you pay me this much? (laughs) Not knowing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of variables, right? Like what are the services? What is your experience? Why, why do you believe you're worth that much? Right. Um, But pricing is such a key critical piece of the puzzle. Right. And making sure that you can live off it too. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. I, I think at the beginning, what I did was again, I probably, I, I did bootstrap the company as well. And I was taking on clients just to get a portfolio, right? Testimonials, case studies. So I came in with a different purpose, but I, my whole goal and intention was break even first couple of years, make sure then I can scale, build my team and then, you know, provide a better service by refining it because I knew at the beginning I wasn't able to do everything. So that's why my price was that right? Um, But understanding what your value is worth, right? Um, And then figure it out because as a business owner, you'll eventually figure it out, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So in terms of um, advancements in technology, how has that kind of helped your business over the years? Um, Do you currently use different software? um, And how has that worked for your business? 
Yeah. I mean, the business that I run now couldn't have existed even, I mean, even five years ago, probably with all the new technology. When I used to, uh, when I first started doing um, coaching from home, I used Skype, which was okay, but didn't like, wasn't a fantastic platform. It crashed all the time. Now there's <laughs> all these tools like Zoom, which I use on a daily basis, which is pretty good, right? Like it has, it doesn't have a lot of issues and I'm able to create recordings and my clients all get the recordings. And yeah. um, I use a lot, I use Facebook. I use Facebook groups yeah. um, as a massive part of my business. I have a free Facebook group and that's where I really engage all my, my potential clients. I have Facebook groups for all my, my coaching groups. Like there's all these different technologies that I use on a regular basis to make it so that I can just run my business from home. Um, and it also means like, I'm not isolated by running my business from home. I run my business from home and I'm like talking to people just like I'm talking to you all day long. So I don't feel like I'm lonely and alone. Yes. I, I'm communicating with people and I have clients in like Dubai. I've had clients in Kenya. I have, cl you know, clients on the West coast oh, of the U S right. I'm talking to people in Australia and like, that's the beauty of the day and age we live in is that you can have clients everywhere and that we can still communicate this way with the internet, with Wi-Fi, with our mobile devices, with zoom, with all these different tools that exist. Yeah. And just imagine like 10 years ago, there was none of this, even like five years ago, even with the advancements of high speed internet, first off smartphones and their capabilities, right? The video on smartphones versus just pictures, right? Like there's apps now that can do so much and you can API and tie things into your CRM or whatever software you have for operations like and you can have drives that you can share amongst your team like there's so much available that people don't understand unless they've gone through 10 years 20 years of running a business right like it's so easy to run a business today and people don't get it right it's just trying to utilize it to the best of the advantage and i think for yourself like having social media and groups it's a great way to scale. And that's something we, we typically should be doing, but we don't. <laughs> um, but that's a great thing that you, you touched upon because you can target clients globally, right? Mm -hmm. And the budget is not as expensive as if you were to do traditional media all over the world, right? You can refine and target your demographics based on ads digitally on platforms that people use on a continuous basis, right? At an affordable level, right? Yeah. And like even just podcast is another example, right? So the fact that I have a podcast, the fact that you have a podcast, the fact that I'm on your podcast, right? This is all like ways that we can use the current technology to grow our audience, to let people know who we are, to bring people into our own spheres. And, and none of that was easy to do 10 years ago, five <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. And creating content. It's so much easier today. Like think about running a radio show, right? Putting it on FM or AM stations, right? Today, a podcast is literally the same thing, hmm. right? TV stations, which they have commercials and real sitcoms and stuff. Guess what? YouTube is pretty much the same thing, right? Like all these traditional media is now on digital. Um, and you, as any business owner or any person, can create the content, upload it, and hopefully people can connect with you, right? Um, same with blogs. I mean, anyone can build a website today, write a piece of content, and hopefully amplify and get people to read it, right? You know, it's so easy today. It's just you got to leverage and understand how you can use technology for your business. Right. Well, and, and, and it's realizing just how easy it is. So in, in the 90s, when I was doing my uh, first degree, I remember the university gave me a free website, but like I had to hard code that in HTML <laughs> to like have one really sad looking page. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now you can like build your own thing, um, yeah. you know, depending, like some of the tools are really quite easy. There's so much potential for you to automate things, right? Like I use tools to automate payments I, like yeah. there's so much out there <laughs> and and it's affordable too as a small business owner 
building a website on Wix or Squarespace or GoDaddy website builder, all these are like 30 to $50 a month, right? Yep. These tools for billing a couple, you know, $10, $20 a month, Zoom, you know, it's not even that expensive, but utilizing these tools to your advantage, right? And understanding who your market is and your audience, but positioning yourself as the expert as well. So no, all these are really good um, points. In terms of networking events, I know you mentioned that you currently still do it or you've done it in the past. Um, How do you find them? Because as an entrepreneur, there's so many events out there, right? How do you even know where to go? And I know you run your own forums and uh, Facebook groups and whatnot. How do you go out getting people that are kind of on in your tribe? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I do tend to go to some local events. I tend to go to mostly women's um, groups. I find that that works well for me. Um, And so locally, that's what I tend to do. Um, And I, I just find them on Facebook. People invite me to a lot of things now, but like, you know, checking out your local chamber, like going out and finding out what's happening, um, visiting, like, I don't like, I know a lot of people sign up for BNIs and things like that. And I'm not, I don't have the time or the capacity to do a weekly meeting, but every once in a while I'll go visit somebody else's BNI. Just so I like see who's out there and meet people. And for me, um, a lot of what I try to do too is be a guest speaker. So I like to get invited to speak at some of these events, which over time gets easier to do. I also will go to conferences that are outside of my city and that's a way for me to break out of my bubble. Right. So, um, I last year in 2018, I went to one in Utah. Like I was like, let's go across the, across the continent and, and meet some new people. Um, this September I went to, uh, a a summer camp for entrepreneurs that was uh, in Algonquin park. And the last few summers before that, I went to a different one that was in the Catskills of New York. And um, for me, part of it is also figuring out what's going to feel good. Like, what do I, you know, what are they doing? What's the, the messaging behind it? Does it align with me and my values? And that is most likely going to mean my people are there too. No, that's, that's a great point because Um, Even myself, right? Like speaking is a big thing. You can impact a larger audience and people actually respect the speaker, right? They come to look for you, but it's not easy to become that uh, keynote speaker or speaker, right? It takes you a while to build that influence. Um, So maybe start on a smaller scale. Like even last year, I just started um, doing my own SEO events locally here in Toronto. So I did partner with like bigger software, um, to back it, to have a brand name behind me, but that allowed me to get in the door. Right. And then I wanted, my purpose was really to practice public speaking, not to get new clients, but really I, I I've never had that skill set. I've always done sales on a one-to-one, maybe one to five boardroom meeting, but not in a one to 50, one in a hundred capacity. Right. So doing that allowed me to, to get outside my comfort zone and I enjoy any challenge that's different, right? Um, so yeah, speaking is one of the things that really can amplify your business. Um, and going to different conferences that are something that you have a passion for, right? Like you enjoy different topics or speakers that you kind of look up to. Um, and getting out there and just, yeah, it might cost you a little bit in terms of flight, hotel, and the event. But make a point to go and meet some of the people as well. Like you're investing a lot of money and you might not know anyone. So don't, don't try to meet everyone, meet a couple people and really get to know them on a personal level, because then you can, you know, maybe be friends with them. Right. Because that's, the goal. Don't try to meet everyone. <laughs> no. And, and that was, that would have been my next point, which is, I know people feel like, you know, like I need to like bring all your business cards and I'm going to try and hand out hundred business cards. That is not nearly as effective as having two conversations with people who are really going to know who you are by the end and who want to know you more after the event. And so stop trying to think of it as a quantity thing, but really a quality thing. So I, um, and I like to know who I want to meet sometimes to be like, you know what? I really want to 
meet some I'm a mortgage broker, right? So then you talk about like, I really was wondering if you had any mortgage brokers you could introduce me to, right? Like the more you have a concept for what you're trying to do, who you want to meet, and knowing that the goal is just to have met one person you want to go out for coffee with if you went to a local event versus um, I think it's going to turn into all this massive business. Like we, we tend to have unrealistic expectations of, of things. And yeah. instead, like just be like, this is going to be a really good connection and I'm going to nurture it. And that's, that's the goal. Yeah. And be clear as well, right? Like what are, what are your clear inten- intentions, right? Um, and stay present. So don't think about the future or the past, like be present wherever you are. Right. And live for the moment because you never know what's going to happen or get come out of it. But as long as you are intentional and love going to this to learn and connect with people that are like-minded, then at least you're going to get something out of it. Right. And then after the event, you be the one to reach back out to those people, right? So don't wait and think that if they liked you enough, they're going to get in touch because most of them are still operating in a, like, I, I'll get to it, but I'm so busy. I don't have time. So just within the first 24 hours an event of an event, send a really quick note. Like I will often send a LinkedIn invitation or a Facebook friend request and, or like a two or three line email that was just like, I really enjoyed connecting with you and I hope we could have coffee sometime or a zoom chat, but you want to make sure that you take the initiative because if you wait for other people, it's not going to happen. Totally agree as well. Right. Because yeah, stay proactive. If you're a doer and you're the one that wants to connect, go out and connect with people. Don't, don't wait for things to happen. In sales or in business, nothing will ever happen if you wait for things to happen. Right? And, and the fear that comes up for a lot of people is that that's being pushy. And so it's really important to realize it's not being pushy, right? Like you're not, you're not connecting with them and saying, so hi, do you want to buy my stuff? You're saying, hey, I really enjoyed talking to you. Would you like to talk some more? And so know that, you know, it's not like you're asking them for something. You just actually genuinely want to connect with that person. It's not being pushy. But we have such a fear of being too pushy, of somehow being the used car salesman as soon as we say anything, yeah. that like we just don't do anything. Yeah. And you, you brought a really po- good point. Like don't sell people. I, I, I'm the opposite. I want to help people. I want to give people advice or connect them with others. So I'm always like, how can I help you? What can I help you with? Like, what is your biggest need today? Like, you know, and hopefully if I can't help, maybe I can connect someone to, to connect with them, right. That they can, um, you know, be of service to them. So, um, yeah, no, asking great. questions will always get you further than telling people what you do. Yes. So I'm always all about asking open-ended questions and nothing related to business. <laughs> because for me, you want to build a connection outside of business, right? Mm-hmm. People care more about other things like your family or travel or, you know, the weather even or whatever it is, right? Like, that is more important to people than what they sell or the yeah. product, right? Yeah, so if you connect to them on a personal level, then they'll like you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, following your drive, passion, purpose, has it changed over the years? Um, what is it today versus how it was when you first started? So for me, it's always going to change, right? Like there's always going to be some pivoting and some changing and something that needs to keep life exciting and and interesting for me. But at the core of it are like my core values are always um, family and community and connection, right? So no matter what it is, it always comes back down to that. And so knowing that that always needs to be a part of whatever I'm building, knowing that I need time for my family, knowing that I need to feel deeply connected to the people that I am with and create community with them, right? So I've created Kids in the Capital. I used to have a conference. I have a really thriving Facebook group for my business because I always want to be in connection with people. So I know that whatever I'm building, that needs to be a part of it. And that's that's the core that drives no matter where I go. Um, and, I, and that's true in my life too, right? Not just in my business. So I think that by having that core that I understand about myself, it helps me be able to build all kinds of things. No, that's, that's awesome. Because 
you know, understanding family is the most important thing, maybe then put in your calendar all the family gatherings first before any meetings, right? Your family trips, family dinners, family movie night, whatever it is, put it in the calendar and nothing in terms of business will overtake that because you know that's more important and more, you know, valuable than anything in the world, right? And stick with it because this is how, if you value family the most, and most people should, but if they don't, that's why there's a lot of, you know, issues in family, <laughs> you know, okay. and people that actually, you know, focus so much on business and think that's the priority. There's other pillars that are very important to people, right? And if you value that more, then put that in. But they also tend to think like, if I build this successful business, and we already know success is, you know, relative, but if I build this successful business, then I'll be able to do all these things for my family. But if you don't actually think about what you want to be able to do first, you're, you're not necessarily going to build a business that works that way. So you want to have a sense for me, like I know that I'm going to get about 10 weeks off every year um, because I take some of the summer off with my kids every year, yeah. right? We are off in the summer. I'm off with them at Christmas. I'm off with them at March break. Um, and it turns out I also want some time off without them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> and so I've built that into my planning. I know that I'm not going to be working full tilt all year long. Like there are parts of my summer, parts of my year that are downtime. So I, when I know that ahead of time, I build my business around that. But if you just build, 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 you know, trying to get to a place where it's a certain level, and then you think that's going to afford you the opportunity to do all those things, it might not work. And I I think because you have had a lot of success and you've gone through it multiple times, people that are just starting off, they have to understand, yes, it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are hours and days that you have to put in a lot of time. But when things start happening and, you know, you start growing and revenue starts coming in, that's when you can really sit down and figure out where you want to be in your business and life, right? And what are the stronger pillars? Because if you set that foundation at the beginning and family is the most important thing, you might not be able to afford it for many, many years, right? You might have, and you might not be a success, right? Because you need to make sure that you are growing and you have a business before figuring out those pillars as well. So it's timing as well, right? Yeah. I mean, I think you need to know what you're trying to achieve. Like just because yes, you know works. what you're trying to do doesn't mean you're going to be there immediately. But yeah. the point is, you know where you're trying to go. So if that's what the goal is, then maybe you don't want to have a business that requires you to have a bricks and mortar store that you're going to have to be at, <laughs> you know, 12 hours a day, yeah. uh, 358 days a year. Like that's a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you want to know like what makes sense. And I've, and I've thought about getting locations. I've thought about doing all co-working spaces, all these things. And ultimately it comes down to, is that going to actually just make it harder to do all the other stuff that I want to do? So knowing that and helping you make the decisions and the growth path that you want to fit into that is key. But yeah, I mean, you don't get it. Like just because you've decided that's the goal doesn't mean you have it immediately, but you want to know where you're trying to go. Exactly. Well, the other option is, you know, when it starts happening, position yourself so you can hire someone that's in charge. Right. And be able to then go on to a different project. Right. Or just own different businesses if, if that's what you want. Right. Um, but you know, just make sure you, you have one successful one first. And so that allows you to keep trying different ones, right? And, and going for different, different ones, for sure. Um, no, those are really good points. Because I, I str strongly believe that family is so important in my life. And so is community, so is health. Um, and then, of course, the business part. Or, but the relationships with my family, friends are so key. And I would not give that up, right? Yeah. Um, because that's that's the strongest pillar right without that you wouldn't be you know who you are um so how do listeners get a hold of you so you know? yeah so the 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 best place the place i most love to welcome people is in my facebook group so it's a free group it's the biz studio community and um it's you know 1600 people, I think. Um, and it's a really engaged 
group. And so I would love to have people join me there. You can also check out my website. It's thebiz.studio and uh, check out that kind of stuff that I have a lot of resources. I have a podcast called The Biz Podcast. So I've got lots and lots of stuff online, lots of free resources um, to get people figuring this stuff out for themselves and for their business. No, that's great. Well, it's been a pleasure, Laura. I really enjoyed our conversations and hopefully some of our listeners are able to take some of this information and do something about it because the, the, the whole purpose of why I'm doing this is really to help entrepreneurs get out their comfort zone and you're not alone. There are people that are here to support and help and there are a lot of resources out there. And if you go out there and seek it and ask for advice, there's a lot of people that will be open uh, you know, opening themselves up to helping the, you. So really appreciate your time, Laura. Thanks a lot. Thank you.